Hey guys, welcome to Kansas City. We're going to break down fights from a strike perspective and provide you with drills to implement into your game. Now, what an amazing fight over the weekend between Israel Adesanya and Robert Whittaker. Now, full disclosure, I'm a huge Israel Adesanya fan. I was a fan back in glory and I was totally pulling in for him to win in this fight and uh, I was totally, totally thrilled. We're going to go on a deep dive here and provide you with our analysis around what happened and how each fighter implemented their game plan and why Israel came out on top. Eugene, what was your sort of impression from the fight overall? Yeah, so there were two key moments in the fight, the knockdown and then the knockout. I think in both those situations, it was trading in close quarters and it was basically 50-50. Yeah. Anything could happen in those yeah. situations. Yeah. Now, a lot of those times in the fight, Robert was trying to come forward super aggressive. Israel was actually able to get out of the way a lot of times. And we're going to go over the footwork component of this fight. So let's say, for example, Eugene here is going to be Israel Adesanya, right? He's going to be nice and dark, a lot taller than me, right? Now, Robert will often come forward. Now, when someone comes forward, what you need to do is obviously evade. You need to get out of the way, especially someone who's super aggressive. You can't just stand there and take the shot on the gloves. So what Israel would do is as Robert would come forward with his double jab, most predictable shot, Israel would take two steps back, He'd switch in the south ball stance, and then he'd circle off, and he'd be out of range. Now, if we just show you a little bit quicker, from further back here. So from here, comes for two shots, he's in south ball, and he's completely out of range. Now, if we pause it and go super slow, Eugene, go from, um, go from your stationary position, take two steps back really slow. Now, just go to south ball. Now, pause right here. So look at all the space that Eugene has created just by going into south ball stance. Now, if Eugene was to stay still and circle up an orthodox stance, we're not actually creating that much space. We're still quite, it's quite square in front of each other. But by going into south ball, look at the difference between the hips, the space between our hips and the, hand, the space between our hands. It's, you're creating a whole bunch of space. Now, Israel was able to use this and get away. If you guys have noticed, if you fight from the orthodox stance, it is always much easier to move to your right compared to moving to your left. And the reason is, it's when you're pushing up your front foot, it's, it allows you to move sideways and also backwards. So sideways and backwards. But if you push up your rear foot, that's mainly for moving forwards as opposed to trying to move sideways and backwards. So from a south forward perspective, it's much easier to move to your left because you have your, your lead foot, which is your right foot, pushing off, and hence you can move sideways and backwards. So I'm going to go over a little bit of the details on how to execute the switch of the stance to circle off. So what happens is, is from an orthodox orthodox matchup, you're swinging your lead foot back, and then you push off your lead foot, which is now your right foot. So you go from orthodox lead foot left foot into south foot right foot lead foot, and then you're pushing off back foot to circle off. Now, when I was watching the fight, obviously as a fan, I was quite stressed watching Israel defend a lot of the shots. A lot of times he would lean back and he'd be so, so close to getting clipped. Now, at Canada City, in terms of defense, the way we focus on defense and how we analyze it is always eyes, feet, hands, then up body movement. And the reason for this is because it makes the most sense to us. So for example, if Eugene is here, the most important line of defense, first of all, is your eyes. You've got to be able to see the shots first. If you have your guard fully closed up and you can't really see anything, or if he shoots a jab and covers my eyes up and I can't see anything, he's taking away a lot of my defense. Now, eyes, then feet. Where your feet are are more important than where your hands are. You can see, that's why a lot of fighters can fight with their hands down. Anderson Silva, right? Israel Adesanya, right? A lot of these fighters fight with their hands quite low and they'll say, oh, keep your hands up. But the reality is that because their feet are in the right position, they're actually able to defend effectively against a lot of shots. So I can have my hands down, and if he shoots a jab, I take a slight step back, I've already defended against a shot. Eyes, then feet. 
Now, hands is the next component of it. I always think of hands up as actually a bit of a striking method. You actually don't need to have your hands up all the time to defend against shots. Yes, it is good to have your hands nice and high. It just adds a little bit extra layer of comfort, right? But it's not the be all and end all. So, eyes, feet, hands, and then obviously the hip movement component of it. Now, when Rob would come in, he should come forward, double jab. If Rob would use eyes first, he'd see the shot, he'd use his feet to step out, and then Rob would come in with another big shot, and he'd lean back, and he would just, just get out of the way. Now, he got away with it, he got clipped a little bit, right? A couple of times, yeah. well, there were a couple of small shots in the end of the shots, right? And it didn't really knock him down or hurt him, right? But it just adds another level of risk. Now, what Israel could have done to actually mitigate a lot of this and take away all the stress for me watching him fight is actually use his hands as part of his defensive structure. So what Israel could have done is eyes first, he's watching for Rob. Rob will come in with his punches, feet first, feet second. Then he'd use his hands to either stuff Rob down or push him off. Then Rob will come forward, either push him off, keep a tight defense, or he'd come forward with the punches and then he'd close him down using his hands and not having to always rely on having a lean back. Having a lean back is great when you can get away with it, but you can actually still get caught. So a lot of times you'll see Israel actually still get caught, even though he had the eyes, the feet, and the hip movement. Rob would come forward with a double jab. He'd lean back, and he'd get caught, still get touched with the left hook. Or he'd be super, super close to getting caught with the left hook. So by adding the hands component to the defensive structure, it could have mitigated a lot of Rob's offense. So before the knockdown happened, Robert was establishing a bit of a pattern. He would come forward, rush forward with punches, and Israel was always trying to evade. But this time, Israel evaded with the counter. So let's go over the clip. We'll play the clip now. Let's go over the knockdown now. So Robert will come forward. Robert will come forward with a jab. He's always step back, and he will put a lot of power in the right hand. He's trying to put everything into it. Now Israel, rather than doing the evasion of throwing the southpaw and circling out, what he did was he added a check hook. He basically hit him with the, touched him with the left hook and pivoted at the same time. So a couple of jabs, and then shoot that right hand, and you just catch him with the left hook. Now he didn't really hurt him with it, he just used that left hook to get out of, out of range, to change his body position from standing right in front of him to standing on the side. So once again, he touched, catch a jab, and then he boom, catch him with the hook coming to the side. And he also threw a punch. And because Rob was put everything in that right hand, he was super heavy on that front stance. And he didn't, couldn't really get back into position, right? He put everything into that right hand, and Wesley was crouched forward in this quite square stance. And that's where the uppercut came right through the middle. Now, it wasn't so much, oh, Israel had a great uppercut. It was more actually that Rob was in the wrong position. Rob put everything in that right hand. Now, we'll change it up a little bit so you can come to the side here. So because Rob put everything to that right hand, shoot the right hand, and he was already off to the side, Rob was basically in a square stance right now. If, you, if Eugene was to stand up and face me right now, just to flip your arms around, he's basically in a square stance. He's standing right in front of me like this. So back into your position where your right hand's overextended. He's basically in a square stance, and that's when Israel, even though his technique wasn't perfect, he was leaning his weight back, he was able to catch Rob, right, in the wrong position. And then boom, hit him down the cut. Based on this fight and Rob's past fights, we notice a pattern in the way that Rob initiates offense. So he has a number of entries that he typically uses in his fights. The, the first entry that he uses is the stomping sidekick. Now if you notice in the first uh, Whitaker Romero fight, uh, Romero was actually the one who was using the sidekick against Rob. And then in the second fight, that's when Bob started to bring it into his game. And he carried that over into the Adesanya fight. So the way that Rob throws it is that he starts off in his, in his normal fight stance, and then he lunges forward and throws the sidekick at the knee. So one of the advantages of using the sidekick is that it is a relatively low risk move because you can throw it from a, a long range away and also it disrupts your opponent's rhythm. So another entry that we notice Rob utilizes a fair bit is the lunging jab. Now usually Rob starts up in his, in his normal fight stance, he has his lead hand lower and then he'll lunge in and throw the jab at the same time. One of the advantages of doing that is that it incorporates a change in the levels. So if you throw a, a normal jab, it starts off at about shoulder height and finishes at about shoulder height. However, if you use the lunging jab, you start lower and you finish higher, and it incorporates that element of surprise. So just to demonstrate, 
if I shoot my jab from shoulder height, so Kevin has already his has his eyes at my shoulder level, and he can he can easily pick up the jab or the cross. However, if I'm having my hand a bit lower and utilizing the lunging jab, it's either I can either throw my cross, which is at shoulder height, or I can use the lunging jab, which is coming from a bit lower and out of his field of vision. Another move that we picked up that Bob utilizes a lot is the double jab, cross, and then high kick. Now we did a video on this previously, so if you guys want to have a look, this click up here. If you've seen the Brunson, Jacare, and the Romero fights, Rob lands this technique on all three of them. So the reason why this technique is so effective is that as Rob follows his punches, the fight's only worried about avoiding that range. Now once Rob follows up with the kick, the kick actually has a longer range than the punch, which catches the fighters off guard. It works on all three of those previous fighters. Really high level middleweights, right? But why didn't it work against Israel? Well, because Rob does it so much, and it's basically the same setup every time. Double jab, right hand, right high kick. Israel knows, as soon as Rob comes forward and shoots a double jab, right hand, he knows, okay, it's not gonna land. I can evade easily. And you just saw him bait twice in both these clips. Now, why didn't this work? It worked against all three previous middleweights, but it didn't even work against Israel. Now, the reason for this is that because Rob's move is always the same setup every single time, it's always going to be the same double jab, right hand, right high kick. And when you do the same move and you only train moves and you don't really train the strategy behind it or drill the different possibilities of offense afterwards, you become limited in terms of your offense. So Israel can do the same thing. Israel can go from right hand into a right high kick. Oh, no worries. But he also is able to mix it up between right high kick into a right hand. You see him against Brunson, you stand in front of him, hit the right high kick, and then boom, hit the right hand right afterwards. Now this is all about how to mix up your offense. You can't just drill one specific move and hope it pays off. Okay, so on to the knockout. Now, honestly watching it, I was very nervous because Israel would always lean back. He's slightly out of position, right, in terms of his weight distribution, and he would try and counter with shots. And it's quite dangerous because we're both training left hooks, and I think it was really just a matter of chance and probability. Israel had the better technique, and that's why he managed to get the knockout. Now, we'll show you the clip now. How did the knockout actually happen? Now, we're going to reenact it a little bit. So, if Robert was really aggressive, trying to come forward, remember with the same entry we we're talking about, which was the lead jab, right? From low, and you're trying to shoot the jab. The jab, and he'd be able to slip to the inside and come over the top, boom, countering with the right hand. Now, that's not what actually happened. What happened was Israel actually got caught and was pushed off balance. So Rob came forward with the jab, he leaned to the inside, but he got caught. He's way off balance now. Rob throws the right hand, Israel throws the right hand, but he's actually still leaning quite far back. He's actually, his weight is going backwards as he's throwing his right hand. And then the trade left hook. So Rob throws the right hook, so Rob throws the left hook, I throw the left hook, boom, and he gets a knockout like that. But his weight's going way backwards. So it wasn't the most pretty knockout, right? It's not like a boxing where you see a real clean left hook KO. Now how did this knockout happen? Well, it's actually down to a battle of right position versus the right punch. So for example, if Eugene here is a day one student, and I teach him to throw a left hook, tight defense, everything else, throw your left hook, Eugene, boom, stay right there. So his foot's turned over, his hip's turned over, his weight's coming nice far forward, his elbow's nice and tight, the angle of the punch didn't come from way back there, so start again from the start, bring your hook nice and wide, or super wide. He didn't go from white, from throwing the punch from back here, he threw his hook, try again, nice and tight, boom, just for there, super short angle, nice and tight, turning that foot. Now, Israel and Robert had a bit of both. Israel had the tighter shot, Robert had the better foot positioning. Now, if you look at the knockout, if you reenact it a little bit actually, so Rob throws a left hook. So Rob's about to throw a left hook. So uh, we'll start with the right hand position. Okay. So, yeah. so we're both landing the right hands. Well, Israel's landing the right hand. Now we're about to throw the left hook. So Israel's off balance. So he doesn't have his weight going forward. He's actually his weight, got his weight going backwards. Rob has his weight going forward. Israel throws the left hook. Rob throws the left hook. But now Rob throws the left hook from way back here. Israel throws the left hook nice and tight. So we trade at the same time. Boom, the knockout comes, right? Now, 
Israel got the knockout because his left hook was tighter, but he didn't have the right weight on that position. He wasn't in the right stance where he could turn the left hook nice and tight and clean him out. He was actually leaning back, his weight was way back, but he still managed to clip him because his left hook was much tighter than Rob. Rob was able to be in the right position, his weight was forward, right? Just like you learned in day one for left hook. But his left hook came from way back here. The turn of time from the left hook to travel from back there to here versus a short left hook meant that Rob was on the short end of it. Now that's the nature of striking, and especially trading shots in the pocket. It's down to probability and how tight your technique is. It just goes to show that Israel has a better technique in terms of punch mechanics, but not actually in terms of his body position, because that's how it is in terms of um, when you're actually striking. Now, in conclusion, what, what are the takeaways from this fight? Well, first of all, if you strip out all the hype, the amazing entry, and the smack talk and all that, that's not striking technique. We're looking only at the striking technique. What you can see is that in Israel's fights against you know, Brunson, and Tavares, and Silva, all his fights are fought at range. He's much better at striking at range and not trading shots. When he's trading shots against Rob, he doesn't look as clean, right? He's sort of off balance, right, as he's landing those shots. Yes, he can knock you, knock you out, he has a good technique in terms of punch, but his body positioning is not as good. Now, I think personally for me, if Israel is able to stay more at range and land those shots from the outside, or when guys come in, he's able to close them down with space, using his lead hands or his right hand to control the guy or stuff the guy down, he'd have a lot more success rather than trading shots. So in his next few fights, it'll be interesting to see if he gains a lot of confidence from being in the pocket and thinking he can trade shots with other fighters, or if he reverts back to his natural fighting style, which you've seen in glory, kickboxing, his Muay Thai, and his initial UFC fights, where he's at range, staying on the outside, and laying those shots, and you know, evading shots and landing big kicks, right? That's his main bread and butter. Right? Thanks for watching. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe, and let us know below who you think will win in the Costa Arsenio match.